Now, during the game, because it's a five-minute game, I go relatively fast. You know, I involve you, I ask people questions, but I go fast, and not everything is going to be easy to follow. If you have questions, I try to answer each and every question. I want every single one of you to feel like you are learning and to understand every step of my thinking process. It's a very ambitious goal, but it's one that I try my best to adhere to. And without further ado, let us get started. It's a five minute game. Let's go. You guys ready to learn? We're playing an 800. That's our highest rated opponent so far. We're gonna stick to the main openings we've been playing, which is E5 and E4. He goes for the Scotch game. Now in the Scotch, we have so far been playing the Bishop out to C5. Development with tempo, very important. He takes on C6. Now, Queen F6 is Charlie's move against XQC, but let's, um, let's just take the Knight here. And I got my own notebook where I write down exactly what I will emphasize after the game. So, what do we do? What do we do in this position? We need to keep developing. In order to keep developing, we need to get this bishop out. So let's go d6. Let's go d6 to open up the diagonal. Why does the pawn structure not matter? I will explain later why even though black's pawn structure may seem damaged, that's actually a good thing as well. How do we continue developing? Buck Pulin, thank you. How do we continue developing? Who And nothing to invent here. No need to reinvent the wheel. Let's just develop actively. Good job, Malcolm Tucker. Okay, now. And this is where we get uh, to the art of violating rules strategically. Okay, goes bishop g5. Now, I don't like this bishop. Let's get it out of here. And... Okay, well, that was a mistake. Bishop, he should have gone bishop f4. What do we take with, obviously, the queen? Fantastic. We've gotten rid of his bishop, and we're threatening checkmate. Our queen is very nicely placed on an active square. All our pieces are playing. Depending on what he does, if he castles or if he goes queen d2, I assume he's going to defend against mate. Well, there's one more thing that we need to do before we even need to think about plans. What is that one thing? What is that one thing that we need to do? We need to castle. Okay, let's take care of the fundamentals before we um, before we think about anything. Else. What? Oh, well, okay, B3. We know from our previous speedrun experience that whenever our opponent pushes a pawn, we need to understand what has been left behind, what weakness has been left behind. In this case, it's very easy to see that he has blundered a knight in trying to defend his B2 pawn preemptively. Retroactively, you guys might realize that I wanted to put my rook on b8 to try to induce that move, but he's done that for us. Let's recap really quickly how we're going to win this game. There are two main methodologies toward winning and converting material advantage. One is to trade off all the pieces and to reach an end game. Then the other is to use that extra piece and attack. We can do a little bit of both. How can we do a little bit of both? We have a move that offers a trade, and if he goes for that trade, we simultaneously enhance our attacking possibilities toward his king. And when I say attacking possibilities, you should be thinking of this f2 pawn, and you should be thinking of how to increase the pressure on that pawn. One is queen d4, perfectly good move, but I personally like the move bishop e6, because I keep the queen on this beautiful c3 square where it's unassailable. He cannot play rook e3. <laughs> Sorry, that was an evil laugh. He did play rook e3, but just gives up the rook, and he resigns. Hmm. This is popcorn stuck in my mouth, sorry. Okay, well, that was a quick one, okay? And um, a couple things. A lot of people take on d4. We have been over that. And the reason that this is not a good move for black, could, does somebody remember? So I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Isn't it the case that you don't want to develop your queen in the opening, and so it would, this would be good for black? Like, why is this not good for black even though the queen is out in the opening yeah you lose a tempo but the, the other thing that i want people to understand here is that you don't have a knight on b8 to attack the queen with if you compare this to the scandy if you compare this to the scandy here white has the move knight c3 with tempo develop him with tempo here he cannot develop with tempo and so the queen is actually nicely centralized so we play bishop c5 and here if you guys remember the game Famous game, XQC against Charlie. It was this position in which XQC with moves moves uh, overturned. <clears throat> the opposite move would have played C3. So Queen F6 is actually another move. But we took with a B pawn. 
Now, why are we not taking with the D-pawn and opening up the center? Well, the reason is simple. He takes our queen. We don't want to get our king out to D8 so early. We need a castle. I don't want an endgame this early. Now, Daniel, why are you... <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I must have got, sorry, guys. I've been talking a lot today. I'm going to try to hydrate as much as possible. Now, Daniel, you might be saying, why are you ruining your pawn structure? As I've said before, pawn structure should not be the most important consideration unless that pawn structure is near the king. What do we gain in return for seemingly ruining our pawn structure? Okay, wh why, what are we gaining? And there's two things I'm looking for. First of all, TRJN says open B file. Exactly. Later on, we could put our rook on the B file. And what is the second thing? This might be a little bit less obvious. November swimming. That man deserves a sub because he just pointed out the other thing. Now this pawn break is going to be a lot easier to execute because that B pawn, that C pawn newly created, is going to be able to support that pawn push. So you guys see how there's many sides to the same coin. Okay, we go D6. Uh, part of the reason that we did not go knight F6 immediately, this would be a little bit inaccurate because it would give white an extra opportunity. In the scotch particularly, you always have to be careful about allowing this move. There's E5. This is not the end of the world, but why allow that when we can simply first play D6? Okay, knight F6, bishop G5, H6. He takes on F6, which is a typical mistake at this level. You see a capture, you make the capture. You've got to critically evaluate every trade that you make. The move bishop H4 would be a lot more effective uh, because it keeps the pin. Jason 77 asks, why D6 and not D5? Well, remember to count defenders and attackers. There is one, two, three attackers. One, two defenders. There's more attackers than defenders. So this would blunder a pawn. Sad thing. I would have otherwise loved to play this move. Okay. So bishop h4 would have kept the pin. Now, I want you guys to answer me or attempt to answer the following question. Would we play the move g5 here? Is there a case to be made for playing this move? If so, what is the case? If not, why not? BC says do not push the pawn. No. Most people are saying no. Why? Amant I... <laughs> Amant... Am I not getting rid of the pin? Isn't that a good thing? It weakens your king's side, bingo. It weakens the king's side too much. No problem, you might be saying, oh, castle queen side, big deal, big whoop, I'm gonna castle queen side. Well, guess what? We did ruin our pawn structure a little bit, so castle and queen side would be unthinkable here with so many open squares. So you gotta be very careful about making a move such as g5. Sometimes you wanna play it, but in this position, I would delay that move. I would probably even consider castling. And yes, this pin is unpleasant, that is true. But you can get rid of the pin by moving the queen out of the way. You don't have to go g5. And once your pieces are more in the game, then you could actually still consider going g5 in some circumstances. But that's a move you got to be very, very careful about. Okay? Uh, so that's basically it. I mean, he took an f6 and very quickly blundered. If he played a move such as queen d2, I was considering going rook b8. This would be emphasizing the benefit of um you know of, of opening the b file and if he goes b3 once again this would be a blunder it doesn't blunder the knight directly but what does this now allow bike wrecker thank you for the sub appreciate it bishop b4 is correct and now the knight is lost so how should white actually defend if you were playing white here let's flip the board how would you actually want to defend the pawn this is very important how do you defend the pawn without making an incredibly passive move such as rook b1 yeah, but, but but guys Problem with rook b1 is that the rook is now completely sort of in I mean, it's it's just, it's not doing anything other than defending the pawn. You gotta be very, very careful about a heavy piece that could be doing a lot of heavy lifting, doing something as trivial as just defending a pawn. So the move bishop b3, very nice guys, would be much better because now you are organically defending the pawn and the bishop is multitasking. Unlike in life, Sometimes it's good for pieces to multitask. The bishop is simultaneously pressuring this diagonal and it's throwing its body against the rook. And it's very nicely supported by pawns. Thank you, Slip the Jeff, for 500. I, you're all good, man. I appreciate the support. Thank you so much for that kind message. That's exactly right. And once he played b3, a lot of people were suggesting queen d4 here. That's a fine move. Totally fine move. But I would argue that after queen e2, that queen on d4 becomes very susceptible to the move rook d1. While the queen on c3, if you think about it, is not susceptible to rook e3, which he played anyway. What is the purpose of the move bishop e6? What do we gain from this trade? Well, we gain a, the trade of minor pieces, which is good. 
And we also gain huge pressure on the F2 square, which we could then transmute into um, some sort of a tactic. So here actually already, and this is a bit advanced, Black has a tactic that allows him not only to win the spawn, but to enhance the attack. It's a two move sequence, could somebody find it? And I'll get to what if white doesn't trade in a moment. Is correct, rook takes f2, rook f2, rook f8, and well, guess what? White doesn't have any pieces to defend this rook with. Obviously, if he defends with the queen, that does not help. I mean, you're defending this rook and you're attacking this one. So if he actually takes, you don't even need to take the queen. This is just checkmate. Um, somebody was asking a very pertinent question. What if the bishop moves away? What have we gained by, well, what have we gained? We've developed our bishop. Now we can bring a rook into the game and later, or even immediately, we can still open up the F file by playing F5, okay? So just wanted to be clear that these are the two methods of, of, of converting a material advantage and we can do both. Okay, so last thing before we move on to the next game. Some, somebody asked, um, knight to d1, you are making the same mistake. The knight is now only defending the pawn and doing nothing else. It's actually sowing disunity among white's ranks. No uh, pawn intended because it's disconnecting the rooks and you really don't want to do that. It's also relinquishing the defense of the e4 pawn, which black can pick up on by playing rook e8. Okay. Um, so last thing, somebody asked, what does compensation mean? What the hell does this word mean? Compensation, you hear it throw, okay, okay, I sacrifice the knight, okay, I had compensation, okay. But okay, I sacrificed the pawn and I had compensation. What does compensation mean? Now, obviously in life to compensate someone for a service rendered means to, you know, somebody renders a service and you get compensated, let's say with money. And the kernel of that is contained in, in a chess sense as well. Uh, compensation is, when you sacrifice material, let's say sack a pawn, and you get something in return for the pawn, and that something is very broad. It could be a million different things. It could be an attack, but, but it doesn't have to be an attack. It could be something as simple as an outpost. It could be something as simple as an open file. It could be something as simple as a single piece or a desirable trade. Uh, you have to think of compensation in a very broad sense to understand its full meaning. And the more obscure the compensation, the more positional the compensation, the harder it is to decide upon to decide upon a particular sacrifice. Now, let me give you guys a very quick example of what comp... I don't want to spend too long on this, but let's talk about what compensation may look like. One second, please. Let's talk about what... Or it could be a square. I will show you guys a very famous example of sacrificing something for compensation. Okay, um, let me think about the game. Um, okay, one second, please. I will show you guys a game between, uh, from the famous Tigran Petrosian, who was, of course, a former world champion known for his positional mastery. And uh, he had a very famous game in 1953. This, some of you will be familiar with this particular moment, but I think it's a great illustration of the notion of compensation and what it exactly entails uh, before we move on to the next game. Um, all right. So, I, and again, these concepts like outposts, all this stuff, I will define it properly as we go along. I'm going to try to weave it into uh, our, our natural discussion. If that, if that, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, now, one second, guys. I'm not sure why this isn't working. There we go. So the position in front of you was uh, played between Samuel Ryshevsky, one of the strongest American players of the 20th century, and Tigran Petrosian was black. Zurich, 1953. Black is worse, okay? Because look at white's beautiful pawn center. D4, E5, you know, if black allows D5. I'm not going to take too long evaluating this. But in this position, Petrosian played an exchange sacrifice in order to, to stop the motion of white's central pawns. Petrosian plays rook e6. He sacrifices the exchange, which means rook for bishop or knight. Ryshevsky doesn't take it immediately, but let's imagine that Ryshevsky would have taken the knight. What is it that black gets in return for this exchange? As Alade64 is pointing out, black gets an amazing square for his knight. What is this square and how does black get this knight to that square? He gets a center pawn in which contests white central pawn motion. That is true. But look at this amazing juicy square for the knight. And look at what happens when black brings this knight here. 
It's actually the best move, actually. It, it is the best move, according to the computer. This knight is unassailable. They call it an eternal knight in Russian. It stops the center. It's amazing in its control, its domination over the board. Is white still a little bit better? Yes. White is still a little bit better, but this is the essence of positional compensation. You get something very weighty in return for an exchange or a piece. It's not actually mysterious. This is what's known as a positional sacrifice. When people hear this word, oh my god, oh, positional sacrifice. Oh. I don't, I don't want to even talk about it, but th that is what a positional sacrifice really is. All it really is is a sacrifice in return for something positional, such as a good square. Okay? Um, that's what it is. How do you come up with this move? Well, Petrosian realized that if he allows a move such as e6, then he's going to be run out of the gym. And so he tells himself, I have to stop this at all costs. And it's worth sacrificing something to stop this idea. There are far more mind-blowing positional sacrifices, which I will get to later. I will write this down. Positional sex. But for now, I just wanted to define that. I hope that makes it a little bit clear. I'm sorry I went so quickly through this position. Vichny coin. Eternal Russian and Russian. Eternal knight in Russian is Vichny coin. Of course. My pleasure. Let's continue, guys. Everybody ready for a second speedrun game? I'm, again, backwards pawn outpost. You guys can Google that, but I will eventually define all these concepts in the course of our games. But I want to keep things moving dynamically. So let's con let's continue. Okay, so we're going to go E4. We're playing net camps already up to the 800s. And uh, that already stumps him, apparently. <laughs> let's see what he does. Okay, he might not make a move. Now, again, all ratings are refunded. I will abort in, in 15. Okay, he goes D6. So he goes for what's called the perk opening. He allows white to gain control of the center. This is not a bad opening if black plays it well, but at the level of my opponent, most people who play this move are not fully aware of how to play this, and they get in trouble very quickly. I'm going to try to show you. Okay, so this is of the category of openings that people play to try to intimidate you, to throw you out of your comfort zone. You guys remember that when we see an opening like this, we need to abide very strictly by opening principles. If we do that, we're not going to get in a lot of trouble. There's a couple of ways to play this. We can control the center even more with our pawns, or we can begin developing our pieces. Either strategy is good. Normally, in such situations, we have prioritized development, but since we're rated a little bit higher, let me show you how I would actually play. So I would actually play the move C4, expanding our central control. But because our center is so vast, okay, and this is where people run into a lot of trouble, so listen carefully, people get too fixated on, on expanding the center and forget that they need to support it with their pieces. So I would not play F4, which would not be a bad move, but that would overexpand my center. It's more important to start developing than to keep expanding and expanding and expanding. So let's get our knight out and start enhancing our control over the center. He's developing terribly, I mean, you guys can see. He's just playing so passively. Uh, and in F4 is good here, but again, I would probably play F4. But let's practice sound positional principles, so let's continue developing. Okay, he his clock wasn't running for some reason. He's played bishop e7, and I really lagged. Whoa. Okay, so something fro froze there. Okay, let's continue. Sorry. I don't know what was going on. Anyways, I lost a bunch of time. There was some server lag. Bishop d3, we're going to keep developing. Now, notice what I want you guys to notice. What I want you guys to notice is that, is that he's developing very passively. We're continuing to develop. Where people really struggle is in transforming in transforming their space advantage into something more tangible. So if you are among those people, I want you to look carefully. And we have a, not a lot of time here on the clock, so I'm going to play a little bit faster. But I want you to look carefully at how I actually do that. Everything is nicely developed other than this bishop. But what do we do with that? How do we actually make stuff happen out of that? Well, normally, when, when I say make stuff happen, what I really mean is we need to expand in the center and we need to start attacking on one of the flanks. Which of the flanks do you think we're going to start attacking on? Why did we put this bishop on d3? Why did we put this bishop on d3? How might we open that bishop up and what kind of stuff are we going to be looking for when we do that? Bingo. We're going to be looking to play e5. And when we play e5, those of you familiar with the Greek gift sacrifice, 
there's one thing to bear in mind which is incredibly important, which is that when you are doing the Greek gift sacrifice, and after the game, before I leave, I'm going to talk about, let me take first, just to avoid the central tension, and then I'll play e5. The Greek gift sacrifice starts with bishop takes h7, followed by knight g5. Here, black has a bishop on e7, guys. So one of the preconditions for the Greek gift is that the g5 square has to be uncovered by your opponent. Here it is covered. So we can't do the Greek gift, but we can do something else. And what I want you guys to understand is that even though you might be thinking of attacking, you should always be looking for more simple ways to win, such as just winning your opponent's material. So here, Mike is seeing the move. I look at this knight, I say, whoa, 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 whoa. Where is this knight? It's on the rim. Does this knight have any escape squares? No, it doesn't. Knight f6, ef. Knight f4, bishop f4. So we can just trap the knight by playing g4. I'm violating a rule here. Daniel, aren't you pushing a pawn in front of your king? You just said this was bad. This is an exception to the rule because I'm winning a darn knight. If he had more pieces on the king side, okay, maybe I would have done this with a lot of reservations, but he doesn't have anything on the king side. This is the consequences of him developing his pieces terribly. The consequences of that is that he is not able to exploit the fact that I've pushed a pawn in front of my king. He has to give up his knight. Let's continue attacking. How do we continue? Well, in order to attack this pawn, we need to bring some pieces into the game. In particular, I'm looking at this knight on c3. Where can we put this knight? Yeah, g5 is good. g5 is good. Let's go g5. Let's actually push the bishop away. And if he takes on c3, that plays into our hands. That actually is a trade, which is good for us. And we get rid of one of the defenders surrounding his king, uh, which is also good. Okay, well, let's take the bishop. Thank you for giving it to us. And now, very important not to play queen h5. That would be a very tempting move, and it would be a very bad one because he plays g6. So let's get knight e4 in, just centralizing the knight. Now we're going to get the queen to h5, and we are going to accumulate the pieces around our opponent's king. Um, he actually probably should take on e4 and go g6, but you know he's on his last legs here. Uh, and the question is, is he going to defend as tenaciously as possible, or, um, well, or is he going to succumb quickly? What are we threatening in this position? I have a feeling that he might miss this. I have a feeling that he might play a move such as e5 if I know these players. What are we threatening? Very good, guys. Knight f6. How do you find a move like this? It's simple. You see h7. You know that you're trying to attack that square. What's stopping this from being checkmate? Obviously, it's the fact that we have a knight here obstructing the bishop, so knight f6. Now, I see that it's not entirely made. He can still take with a knight. If he takes with a knight, he defends h7. We take the knight. He's got to go g6. And what kind of mate am I already thinking about? What kind of mate am I already thinking about after he goes g6? I want the name of this mate. Bingo, lobster pincer mate. Can I mate, can I mate him immediately with queen h6? Don't rush, guys. Very important to be disciplined. Can I play queen h6? No, you cannot because of queen takes f6. That's okay. I saw that. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop the queen back. Then we're going to bring the bishop out. And now we're threatening the lobster pincer mate. He has to go h5 in order to defend. He doesn't. So let's lobster pincer him. You see how clear when you're up a piece and you're attacking like this, you're not always in a hurry. Thank you, Flyerton. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, my friend. And this will be the last game of the stream, guys. And I will return around 1 a.m. or so for another hour to continue the speed run. Bishop takes f6. And we can actually pre-move queen g7 because... Uh, because there is just no defense. Now, very quickly, what if he had played h5 in order to block the queen's block the queen's access to h6? Well, here's how I think of this position. Do you guys see the relationship between the bishop and the queen? Okay, this relationship is a very important one. I have told you guys about it before. When there is a relationship like this called an X-ray. A piece staring at the queen in particular through the lens of another piece. You immediately, and everybody's seeing this so quickly, that's incredible. You immediately need to start thinking, okay, if I play f7, that's going to be a check. I'm going to win his queen. And so you can play bishop takes g6, sacrificing one bishop. f takes g6, f7, and you win the queen. But Daniel, you didn't give lobster pins for mate. I thought you wanted to give lobster pins for mate. Well, that's where the notion of flexibility comes in. Okay, you have to be flexible as to the objective of your attack. Winning a queen... I think nobody would disagree with me, is a pretty good result of an attack. 
So that's why it's so important to be open-minded to what it is you're trying to accomplish, okay? So that's what I would do. If he doesn't take the bishop, then the road is clear. You can play queen takes h5 or bishop h5. The king is wide open, and at your leisure, you could basically give the lobster pincer mate. All right, Shinigami, thank you so much for the seven months amazing stuff going on. And um, that's basically what I did. Now let's quickly go over the game. I do have to run, uh, but let's quickly go over the game. I thought I had a little bit more time, but that's okay. I might be back, guys. Um, I think that everything I did in the opening should make sense to you guys. I played bishop d3 because I'm anticipating him castling, and I want to play e5 and open up the bishop's control of the h7 square. Thank you, Hortbeck, so much. Appreciate it. Um, and here I played e5, and what would I have done had he played knight e8, which is a better move? How do we actually proceed uh, with the attack? Now, one thing that I want to make very clear is that when we have a pawn on h7 like this, when, when we try to Greek gift, as I said, we can't do this because g5 is under black's control. That is the litmus test for determining when a Greek gift sacrifice works. Sometimes it works even when there is a piece defending the square. That is a complicated scenario, which I will go, to, go through later. But I want to talk about the notion of a battery. Batteries are when two pieces are stacked either on top of each other or on the same diagonal. Usually the most effective batteries are going to be doubled rooks, which is a type of battery, or the most famous battery, a queen and a bishop on the same diagonal. Do we want it to be like this? No, we don't. Because when we have a queen bishop battery, we normally want to lead with the queen. Why do we want to lead with the queen? Because white threatens checkmate. And if we juxtapose that with this position, this is a serious threat, but it's not a threat of checkmate. There are exceptions to the rule. Sometimes the situation is chaotic, so you want your queen behind a wall of defenders. Here, his pieces are so passive that we can set up the battery with total impunity. Now, wait a second. We set up the battery big whoop, he just defends. But the point of the battery isn't to deliver checkmate, right? We think he's going to defend against checkmate. But when he plays g6, he introduces more weaknesses on the king side. This is how you attack, which we can then exploit by putting our pieces on better squares. Now we can do a bunch of different things. We can get the knight over to f6. And again, this position smells of a lobster pincer mate. So what I want to make very clear is that attacking is not about finding one idea and then getting super disappointed when this idea doesn't work. It's about orchestrating ideas, and when the, these ideas don't work in the sense of delivering a mate, we think, okay, well, how is this idea weakened his position? How do we develop new ideas that stack on top of what it is that we were trying to do in the first place? Riemann asks a great question. What about bishop c6 to stop queen e4? Well, there's a couple of things we could do here. We could go rook d1 to create the pin against this queen. We could attack on multiple angles. And guess what? If he plays queen b6, we can already think about playing knight g5 because we ask ourselves, what is the drawback of his queen move? Well, gets this queen away from its control of g5 so we can play knight g5 to open up the queen's access to h5. This is all part of the art of attacking chess. Attacking is incredibly difficult. That is a skill we master over the course of many years. Um, and um, obviously, it, even I have not mastered attacking. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that involves so many complex elements that, um, that, that there's so many components moving parts. What are other ways besides a Greek gift to translate central control into a tangible advantage? Well, Jeff, I'm talking about them here. You, you're not seeing Greek gift sacrifice. What you're seeing is a sustained effort to attack the spawn without a Greek gift. There's also concepts of transforming a central advantage into an attack on the other flank. You don't have to always attack the king, but that is the fundamental transformation. I mean, I'll talk also about queenside attacks. Um, and uh, last question. So what if in this position, when, what if he just goes h6? Well, guess what? h6 weakens his king. And how do we exploit this weakness? I'm already thinking of sacrificing that bishop on h6 later on. This is called a hook. I'll talk about hooks later. Um, and I'll talk about other attacking elements. For the time being, guys, I do have to take off.